a half vacation, half a fashion week, call it a vacation. We just hope uh, she comes back and doesn't change careers on us. Let me know if you can hear me okay. And feel free to copy and paste uh, any of your questions right in. Look at this, how fast it happens now. We're also gonna try something. We got a couple of new things uh, that we're gonna try this on this call. Since I figure, you know, Jill's not, Jill's not gonna be here, so it's gonna be a complete disaster anyway. I figure we'll get all the new stuff out all at the same time. So if you do have a question, you should, uh, you should be able to see a way in either the chat box or in the participants, I think it's a chat box, a little way to raise your hand. And if you wanna raise your hand, our uh, producer, Aaron, or myself can click on you. And if your mic's on, you, we can talk. So while we're trying to figure that out, I'm gonna try, I'll address these first couple of questions here. So Michael says, if you buy a property with back taxes, what maximum rule of thumb percentage taxes to land value ratio would you use? For example, if a two acre parcel was worth 3,000 bucks, what would be the maximum amount of back taxes uh, you would take over if the owner were simply to give you the property and sell it for a nominal amount, like 100 bucks? You know, that's such a personal, uh, there's a million ways to answer that, like I guess everything in this, uh, in this business model. So um, it, it's gonna have to, it really depends on what you think you can sell it for, what the profit margin is uh, and the whole thing. So um, it's hard in, our, in this business, especially West, not so much East and especially North, Northeast where the taxes seem to be a lot, my, a lot higher. By the way, uh, New Jersey has the lar largest property tax rate in the country. I just found that out a couple of days ago, which was kind of surprising. I was convinced it was California or New York. Uh, but anyway, it, it was really just a function of what you can sell it for. Um, I had a couple of really interesting consulting calls this week and uh, about pricing, because we've been talking about it on the, on the podcast and um, in a lot of different places uh, all over, you know, all over where we air. And it came down to, to really grossly simplify it, what you think you can sell it for. And you need to buy it for half of what you think you can sell it for, uh, you know, I always say within two weeks. So, you know, if it's worth three grand and you're, you're getting it for a hundred bucks, uh, if you're all in at 1500 or a thousand, let's say just to be super safe, that would pass my test. Nick, I'm gonna sign up today to do a deal, a data review, okay, with me. And I was wondering what the general format is. Oh, this is a perfect opportunity for me to explain uh, how you can get the most out of these consulting calls. Um, what the general format is. So uh, is it a phone call, Skype, Zoom, et cetera? Uh, remember hearing Jack say uh, to email all your information, that's right. Um, and you don't have a microphone or a camera, that's okay. Uh, are, are they needed? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can do it and I've done probably most of them. And I'll tell you what the best way is and then we can work backwards from there. If it's a data review uh, situation where you have a, um, you've done everything that I talked about in the cash flow from land program and uh, implemented all the stuff that we talk about on the show and everywhere else, you have a data set. And if we can screen share that data set and you can sit there and point and say, you know, uh, I chose all these properties for this reason, I did this and this and this, and this is how I priced them through this methodology. What do you think? Is it gonna work? And uh, probably 50% of the time, when, uh, I, when we get to the call point, uh, you know, the data set's not ready. So we spend, you know, it's just, it's not, you're not getting the most out of the money, out of the money you spend. So if you have a data set ready and I can say, you know, I'll tell you after, I mean, it's really, really helpful. After four acres to eight acres, you should change the pricing to this. I would change it to this and here's why. And then I give you a bunch of experience reasons why. Man, that you get $250 worth plus probably a lot more. So that's the best way. If you can screen share it and we can talk to each other audio, that's my preference. So 
Um, Nick, if grab a grab a nine dollar microphone or borrow one from somebody, you know, a three point five mic. Or if you're on a Mac, I mean, most of the computers these days have one, right? They have them uh, built in. I mean, I don't use it that built in computer, but I, I would I bet every single person that I speak with does. So there's a pretty good chance, unless your uh, your computer's from the eighties, you have uh, you have what you need. And to everybody else, I'm going to take this opportunity. Um, these calls go really, really well the more you put into them before we get into it. So if you want to look at, you know, if we do a deal review situation where you come to, you know, you come to the meeting and you say, I looked at, there's nine properties on Landwatch and let's screen share and I'll show you. They all sold for, or they're selling uh, the least amount of, the least pro the property selling for five to 8,000 bucks. I'm pulling, uh, I'm, buying, I'm all in on this one for 2,000 and 3,000. You know, we're all going to sit together say that's great or we're not. But if you come to the uh, the call with not without that information or before you've gotten to that point, I just don't think you get as much out of the call as you can. Okay, fair enough. So Gene says, what was the Washington State County uh, you referenced in yesterday's podcast? Wash oh, I can't say it. Gene, I can't say it. Honestly, I, I don't remember. But it was... Um, it was a county in Washington State, if you didn't hear the show, where there was somebody that was retiring. You know, it'd be, fun, be funny if that person was a member. She was close to retiring, or I'm not. It was pretty, uh, pretty crotchety. We, we uh, around the office, we, we still talk about her. So, <laughs> let me leave it at that. Oh, that was a private uh, message to me. Kathleen says, Jack, are you available uh, any other day for the data uh, review besides Wednesday, maybe Fridays? Yeah, Kathleen, we'll, we'll work something out. I don't want to make it a, a rule, and, um, and we will do it. You know, it's going to be a lot of times on the data and deal review, we go way over. And I'm, I'm happy to find to do that because I kind of ice out Wednesdays to do that. It's like, uh, you know, some doctors are also surgeons, and Thursday is their surgery day. So they get mentally all prepared for it, and they do a bunch of stuff. I mean... As a patient, you don't know that they're doing that, but every Thursday, so that maybe they don't drink as much before that night, the night before and all that. That's what happens with me on Wednesday. You, you know, you get, you get your money's worth. So if you want to do it on Friday, Kathleen, it's at your own risk. The answer is yes. Reach out to Aaron, please. Luke Smith says, what is the lowest monthly payment you ever do? This is a great topic. I, I've done a lot of analysis on this and a lot of, uh, I have a lot of experience offering super low payments. I'm thinking, thinking I'm offering a lot of them at 25 bucks a month. Uh, if you do 4,000, that's a hundred thousand a month, uh, in cash flow. you know, do you think the market, um, you know, okay. So in, in his last sentence says, do you think, uh, I can market the, the cheapest land in the U S on terms, <laughs> the cheapest land. I can hear it now. I can hear the, the tagline. That is the tagline, the cheapest land in the market in the US on terms. Yeah, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna post it. I've done this on eBay. You're gonna post this stuff and I did it all at $50 down, $49 down, $49 a month for like 60 or 72 months, like a car, like a car payment. And they sell it incredibly quickly. And, but your recension fallout rate is, is uh, you have to bank on a recension rate of 75 to 85%. 25 a month, man, I can't even imagine. You know, well, look, you're experienced enough. You've heard it all. People say, you know, I thought that was the whole price of the property. I thought the whole property cost $25. So will it work? Absolutely. But you really have to budget at least 75% fallout. 75% won't even make the first payment. Let me put it that way. So but I still think you can make it work because regular businesses, you know, I don't need to say it to most people in this group. Regular businesses make three, five, eight, ten percent if they're if they're lucky. So we're fortunate enough to make a hundred percent most of the time. So if you can get twenty to thirty or forty percent out of it, Luke, and uh, you can bank on the fact because you don't. None of us have acquisition problems here. We shouldn't. You know, if you if that's your sales methodology, it could very, very, very much work. It'd be tough to do it by yourself, but I think you have an army full of relatives helping you. So that could work. I'd like to actually, if you could try, a, you know, try a few and, and uh, let us know how it goes. 
Michael says, if you buy a property with back taxes, will a single payment to the county stop a potential lien sale here? Oh my gosh, these are good questions this week. Okay. Here's how it works in Arizona. There's a concept called subsequent liens. So if a property's got, if a property's way back, like it's four, three or four years into the process, in year five, it actually goes to deed status. You technically have to buy the lien, liens and then all the subsequent liens. So there's a lien for each year. So if it's five years ago, there's a 2015 lien, a 14 and a 13 and a 12. And you would definitely wanna buy all the subsequent liens. So can you make a single payment? Just let's say you want to, you're looking at, you're staring at a green bar IBM sheet of 72 million back tax, you know, uh, tax liens in some county. And I think probably what he's getting at is how can I pay the least amount to stop the legal action so I can move on and just can get equitable, theoretically equitable title of the property. And um, yeah, you can do that. If you buy the oldest lien, you theoretically are pushing the foreclosure action the uh, administrative slash judicial foreclosure action the county's going to take to get it to de prepping it for deed status to sell it at a deed auction. So yeah, but you're only, you're kicking the can down the road. And if you're burning through cash um, to do that, I mean, it's, it's a little scary, but if this is just a theoretical question, the answer is yes. You can buy the oldest lien and it pushes it up. It gives you, it buys you a year. What it also does is it signals everybody else who's a, in a, a lien investor that there's some activity on, the, on that property. And because what happens is these lien investors, they don't do, they don't, they're lazy like everybody. They don't, they don't want to, they want to do as the least amount of homework as po uh, possible. So if they see one property, a vacant piece of property in, in a sea of lists of properties that have liens on them, that somebody named Michael's buying, you know, buying not the subsequent liens, just one lien, the oldest one and makes them want to invest in it without even looking into it. So you just have to be careful. There is a little bit of, of uh, competition. Yeah, less, <laughs> less than your daily coffee, Joe, I like it. All right, Luke and, Luke and Michael are having a little banter. Jordan says, not really a strange question, but just something I think about for price and guidelines, uh, you say go to land watch and look what land is selling for in that county and then deduct from there. Uh, why do these people, uh, why don't these people just sell it uh, for that amount on land watch themselves? To be blunt about it, right? I don't know. I think, here's my theory. I think that we purchase property the cheapest on the planet. I don't think that other people are out there doing it this way. So I think it's priced accordingly. I also think that mo almost all the people I've ever known in this industry are obsessed with maximizing price, you know, and it's built into our, uh, our business model not to do that. So I bet that there's people on there that are, you know, they paid too much for their property. You know, they do exactly what we don't want to do. Pay too much for their property and they're trying to sell it for too much and they're not moving it out of there fast. I think that that answers your question. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Let's see here. Are deal reviews for 250 bucks for everyone now? No. Um, it's just the $250 is the, is the, uh, the probe member price, the silver member price. It's the, the deal. I don't do deal reviews for the general public. I only do it for people in the group. I do 15 minute calls about people who, for people who want to join the group and for everybody in this group, I'll tell you what the secret is there. I'm actually now at the point where if they don't, if they're not a logical fit, I've, I've turned several away, several away in the last two weeks. If you go on the first page of uh, Land Academy, you'll see my mug there instead of Jill's. And um, so I have, I'm taking the so-called uh, pre-qualifying. It doesn't look like that. It looks like, hey, just give Jack a call. What it is, is if you're a ding dong and I've talked to you for a few minutes and you're not gonna fit in the group, well, that's not, we don't, we're not gonna let you in. We're at that point where, you know, we're at that point where we don't need to do anything like that at all, so. 
I hope that answers it. Luke says, you guys get a call from Land Watch or Land and Farm and Lands of America about new rates. Have you ever tried their showcase listings, mass mailing uh, email bombs? Yes, yes, and yes. Lots of uh, monthly fees and annual contracts. They've been getting more leads uh, recently than Land Watch for me. Yeah. Uh, so I talked to, I have a rep there because they try to get us to do banner ads and, and we will be doing banner ads for LandPen and some other products that we're gonna roll out over the next 90 days. And so I asked them all these blunt questions exactly like you're asking. And so they've made a lot of changes. Um, they, they've invested a ton of money. They have a, actually have a, like a magazine magazine, like it's the seventies. It's really cool. It's like architectural digest. Anyway, um, they purchased land.com and paid you know, a mint for it. So they're making a lot of changes. They're raising their rates. I've noticed that their SEO is not as good as Landwatch. Landwatch is a little bit more rough around the edges, but they get better, way better SEO and better traffic. If you look at, a, you know, there's ways on the internet, you can see how, how much traffic sites are getting. And for some reason, Landwatch does better. Well, I know why. They, they have SEO people on staff there. But they're trying to be, you know, the Tiffany's of the land business. They're trying to be a little bit more stylish, which cracks me up because land is kind of, we're all grassroots here. But um, that's great, Luke, that you're getting more leads. I, uh, I, have his, I don't have any super recent experience. You probably have more than me. But um, it seems to me that they, uh, they don't generate as much as Landwatch does for some reason. If you look at the site, like they have no real map search. If you really look at it, look at a line up a, an individual listing um, with Landwatch and Land and Farm. Line them up together. It's, you don't get as much information at Landwatch. You know, it's one of the reasons that we're, we're develop, you know, we're continually uh, developing LandPen to be the best. So there, there'll be mapping functions and, and uh, it, there will be leaps and bounds different than both of those, uh, you know, both of the way, the way you shop for property on LandPen will be very different and much more conducive to finding what you want. Michael says, if you own a property with back taxes and you can't sell it and continue not to pay, is your credit affected? No, that's a good question. Oh, you guys, you know, I was like, oh my God, I got to do the show without Jill. And no one's going to ask any good questions and I'm going to have to tell jokes for an hour. This is good though. Thank you for providing good content here. Um, no, your credit is never tied. And don't ask me why. Um, I, I, we buy a lot of property from people who think that they're going to go through some type of foreclosure the way that you would with a, a mortgage does with a house. And, the, and the, the answer is the county doesn't do anything like that. I'm not sure they even have your social security number. So no, you don't, there's no credit. I don't think, I don't, I've never given my social security number or, or EIN number to, uh, to a county ever. So no, it just goes off into the sunset. And we have, every year we let them go back sometimes. You know, here's an example. We let one back go back this year. It was I, on accident in a group of properties. It was a partial ownership. So it used to be back in the day, this is before my time, California issued APNs, the separate, AP, get this, separate APNs for ownership. So if me and Luke and Michael decided to buy a property together, and the way you do it now is you do a joint tenants. Well, back in the day, you had the option to do three APNs. So it's, it was a mess and it is a mess, continues to be. So every once in a while, you, you know, you, actually everyone should know this on this call. When you send letters out, you're, it, you have, there's a potential to send a, a partial APN owner. And so we bought a couple of those and we just, I didn't even try to pursue it. We just let them go back. Luke says, what are your best free marketing strategies? LandPen, Craigslist, Zillow, in-house mailing list, et cetera. What's your favorite advertising to pay for to sell land? All right, so there's two questions. What do you like that's free? And what do you like to pay for? Here's, here's two free advertising uh, scenarios that, that wor have worked for us in the last seven days. Post a property on LandPen. And make sure that your all your social media is really up to speed. You know that you've got a lot of people that you're contacting with in Facebook specifically that you're you're in the ten or thirty or forty vacant land oriented real estate groups that are active. And then in, uh, on the bottom of the posting, share it with everybody. 
the spikes that you will get on your own website because it throws up a graphic and the price and the whole thing. And the way that you guys, I mean, we were just talking about this with some staff at lunch today. There's some amazing properties on land. You know, we, our staff goes and does it uh, without you guys even knowing about it on all of our social media. This is totally free, by the way. And we watch the spikes just on land. So um, social media sharing on all four or five of the sites on the bottom of each uh, posting is a fantastic way. I mean, there's dedicated groups in, in, social, in uh, Facebook about buying and selling rural vacant property in like the, the state that you're, wherever the property is. So it, it's hard to get a more captive audience than that for free and for like literally three or four seconds of time. The second one is to run, if you don't know how to post a Facebook ad, um, please learn. It's like, if you do it properly, you can get it for less than half of a cent a click and it goes to absolutely the right people. Their analytics and their metrics about finding people in their interest is shocking. So, and make sure if you do that, share it with me. Share it with me on uh, Facebook. I'm, I'm connected, between Jill and I, we're connected to like, last time we checked, like 1.8 people that are, they have expressed some type of interest. This is without advertising, just the people that are following us and stuff. So we've had very, very, very positive experiences with both of those. For paid advertising on Craigslist too. Uh, Craigslist is awesome for vacation type property or higher price property uh, on terms, if you're selling on terms. Zillow, I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever sold a property off of Zillow. Mailing list is fantastic. Make sure you, uh, I don't know, Luke, I haven't checked lately if you guys, if, any, if you put it on our Platinum Sellers Club, that goes out to probably 10,000 people every week. And for as far as paid advertising, I think the best thing you can do, God, this, this, it chafes me to say this out loud, is to pay for the, the boost in uh, Landwatch. That's probably the be uh, best bang for your buck. For little tiny properties, not so much, but like 40 acres for eight or 10 grand, they usually do really well there. Jordan says, well, to clarify the question a bit, um, why would someone sell, a, uh, sell to us for a thousand bucks, let's say, when they could sell it on Landwatch to four, oh, okay. Oh, all right, so when they could sell for 4,000 bucks or whatever, um, you know, why would, the question is this, why would somebody sell to us for a grand? when they could just post it on the Landwatch and sell for 4,000 bucks. Well, I mean, that's the business that we're in. And you know, if you're brand new, you've never heard the, the gallon of milk scenario. So I'm not gonna, I won't put everybody else through it, but people are very strapped for time and they would much rather have a thousand bucks and have it served up to them at their front door in the form of a cashier's check with all the paperwork than they would to go through all the stuff. They don't know how to take credit cards. They don't know, they don't have any idea where to even get a picture of a piece of property that's nearby. Um, so I know it's, I used to think that too. I also used to think, and this hasn't happened, I don't know why, why the counties just don't sell property online. Why don't all the tax counties, the, the property, they did liens and deeds, the whole thing. So the fact is the people that work at the county are not computer savvy. It's just two completely different talents. So I, you know, I thought there'd be flying cars by now too. So I don't know. There's a saying in Hollywood that goes like this. Nobody knows nothing. So Jordan, I can't answer you. I don't know. I can only give you my opinion. Luke says, I got their magazine. Okay, sweet. And it's a phone book size land for sale. It really is cool. It like, Jill just like salivates over it. We get it too. Land and Farm says they hired 50 people to work uh, their SEO stuff and their, um, and they're upping, upping land watch now. Okay, all right, so it worked. That's good. Uh, you know what, I'll test it and, and I'll report back. Robert Hall commented into Jordan, sellers uh, wanna get rid of their property not to market it. That's right. I mean, that's, that's the whole business model here. They just wanna get rid of it. And the agents, they don't wanna go through the agent thing. And in, in most agents, Nine out of 10 agents, unless they're brand new, aren't gonna take a, a, an eight, eight to $10,000 property and list it and go through the whole thing. My little sister is a real estate agent in Northern Michigan. And she told me recently that she gets calls from people, her regular like 
house listing people that she sold houses to and listed houses for who have land either they've inherited it or whatever for whatever reason they own land and, and she won't list it because it just sits there and she has to go out there and take pictures of it she told me it takes about seven hours from start to finish to list a property in the mls if you do it right there's probably some agents on the call i don't i don't know if, if, any, if you could pipe in and see in and just give that a, like a, a reality check that'd be great because i've never done it but i see the mls and it's pretty it looks pretty complicated we were um, around the office with the it staff kicking the idea around of matching up county data with mls data and making it easier to uh for agents to, to release a product or develop a product to make it easier for real estate agents to post property because 90% of that stuff's in the assessor's database anyway. Hey, we have access to the assessor's database. So if we could link those two databases, it might be easier. Okay, let's see. Land watch is falling off, Jerry says. You know what? I love to hear that. I would love to pick up their market share at Landpin, which is what we intend to do. And then Joel says, at least for me, the people that I'm buying from only heard from me and replied, why, yes, I do want to sell. I don't think they uh, much more, they, they much more thought about it than that. I could not agree more. It's not about price for them. It's just about, yeah, I really, I'd love to not get a tax bill any longer. Luke says they got a new, uh, they got the new site land.com. I talked about that, I think last week. That really, really makes me jealous for some reason. I wonder, I don't know what they paid for it. I hope they paid a ridiculous amount. That would make me feel better. Tim says, a few weeks back, you said uh, you, roll out the LL you roll out of LLC and start new ones. Why? Okay, so there's a few theories on this. And I'm not an attorney, I have to say it. I am an accountant, but not really anymore. What I like to do is run out, have an LLC. Jill, have, Jill and I have constantly have concurrent LLCs in different states. Some of the stuff goes into her, her, hers, some goes into mine. And, uh, you know, once, the, once we run, I don't know, some number, it's usually years, not numbers of property, two or three or four years, we just, we file the last tax return for that LLC and just start another one. And so all those old transactions, uh, from a liability standpoint, die with the corporation through, unless there's any criminal activity, which there's not. The liability from the transaction itself dies with the company. And so you just get to start fresh the whole time. The other concept is, and you see, you, you talk, you hear people talk about this who do a lot of house deals and rentals and stuff, that they do an LLC per deal, per property, which seems crazy to me. Unless they're filing their own tax returns, it's crazy expensive. And, and convoluted and you gotta have separate bank accounts, it, it, it's to be a nightmare. It's hard enough after like two or three years to have bank accounts associated with an LLC and then terminate, file the last return and then uh, shut the bank accounts down. Because this day and age, there's all kinds of auto pay stuff set up to it. So you really gotta have like an oversight bank account slash LLC that where all these other ones uh, uh, roll up. And it's a lot easier to do if you don't have a lot of partners. So the concept is, Liability dies when the LLC dies. For houses, uh, if somebody slips and falls or for whatever reason there's a lawsuit, the liability is tied to that house only if it's in a single LLC. Again, as long as there's no uh, criminal activity. Jerry says, is that fractional ownership stuff we've seen? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure, Jerry. I haven't, I haven't seen it for a while. The properties that we like go back, I think there's two of them in Arizona, specifically in Mojave County, where, um, you know, we've owned them for <laughs> a lot of years, you know, five plus years. Yeah, Luke says separate APNs for ownership sucks. It's just a lot of work, man. Uh, I mailed them out and got crazy calls and, oh yeah, sure, right. Oh, separate APNs, sorry. I thought you meant separate LLCs, yeah. Uh, 100 and 128th ownership? That's amazing in Kern. 
Okay, good. So you've experienced it too. It's not just me. I wish they could identify it. Like if there's a number scheme that we can remove, or maybe there is, I don't know. A number like if it had it ended, it starts with a an S or something like that. You can take it out of the uh, out of the posting or out of the listing. I mean, the, the sort the uh, sort or scrub. Anwar says New York City. Anwar says uh, Jordan Jack gives a, a gallon of milk example exactly. You buy milk three ways. You buy it at Walmart, the convenience store, and the grocery store. And nobody ever says at the convenience store, "Why am I paying so much for this?" They just don't ask that question. You walk through the door knowing you're going to pay some extra uh, money for com for convenience. Man, I think I even used that in a CFL program. Joel says I had one seller uh, that was going to that was showing on the county GIS page as half ownership uh, with his deceased father. I requested the deed from the county, got it the next day. And now see that he owns the land alone. He told uh, he actually told me that uh, he would take less less than my offer uh, if I could take care of the uh, details. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we do this every week. You know, we inadvertently become attorneys, sort of, or at the very least, um, legal assistants. You know, for estate planning. So yeah, and there are some people in this group and people I've known over the years that they make a career out of that. So there's a somebody in this group that in Colorado that that's a certain niche. They just they found out how to to uh, do a, a, a real a simple estate probate without going through probate in Colorado, and that's what they do. They advertise it now. You know, we'll get you out of this property. We'll pay a couple hundred bucks, and you can find some smoking deals. They advertise on Craigslist. Luke says he finally told uh, sold a property on Zillow. Total mess. Lots of communication and BS to get it closed. And here's why. Zillow and Trulia, which are now one. RealQuest is a back end of Zillow and Trulia, by the way. So you can feel good about that. Can you believe that? You have the access to the same data. They just present it much differently, obviously. So the thing is with Zillow and Trulia is it's all, it's not GPS based. It's based on address, physical address. And the address has to be somewhere in the database. And if so, if it's not, like almost all the properties that we deal with, you have to find the, the nearest property. Well, think about that. You're in West Texas and you're gonna try to, try to find the nearest actual like post office verified address in West Texas in like Cutsworth County. It's a, it's a long way away. So when people are looking for property, sorting through it, it's a really antiquated sorting function on both of those sites. It's not for land, it's for houses, that's why. And you know, a picture comes up or, a, or a, a land pin comes up on a dot on a property, it's nowhere near where the actual property is. So it causes a lot of confusion right from the very second that they make a decision to pursue it, the buyer. So you just have to talk and talk and talk. You're right, Luke, it's, it's not worth it. I'm, it's not worth it for us. Chip says, I downloaded some data on RealQuest and there were not many records. So I opened up the query from just one acre to one uh, to one through five acres, which yielded more. The problem is now when I go to the uh, mail merge, I haven't figured out a way to price the properties appropriately based on the size, since they're different, right? You know what, this is the second time this came up this week. So good, I'm gonna explain it. Has anyone mastered this? Or I just break, need to break up the data into acreage sizes and separate out the mailers. Okay, here's the deal. I don't think that you should and I somehow conveyed this, maybe not in the best way in the program. If you're in the program, I say, here's a universe of five acre properties in Mojave County. And we're gonna send out offers for 500 bucks. And that's exactly what I mean when you're doing your first mailer. Make it simple. After a few mailers and you've gotten into this, I don't think it's really appropriate to just say, here's a five acre property, it's $500. Here's a four acre property, it's $500 and on and on and on. I think you have to come up with some type of simple equation that says at the top for this five acre property, I'm gonna offer 511, 512, 513, or come up with some type of scheme based on um, an APN scheme or potentially even assessed value. Everything assessed from this top number to this number gets uh, $55 more or $3,000 more. 
So I don't think that you really should ever, if the, if the larger the database, the more this is true, just have a hard coded number per acre. I think you should, what you wanna do is you want that person to open the offer and say, Mr. Smith, well, we'd love to buy your five acre property for $582.31. That makes me want to pick, if I was Mr. Smith, I'd, what the, how did that guy come up with that number? And if he gets two or three letters because his name's the same or there's, you know, he's he spelled his name wrong, the assessor, and they're all different prices, but only slightly, that's, now he's starting to ask himself some questions. Like maybe these people, maybe they're nuts, maybe they're not. They obviously know something I don't, I better call them. So get creative on that. The examples that I use it in the cash flow from land program, I can't say this enough, are exactly that examples. They're meant for people who are brand new, who, and I try to simplify it. The whole point is to get that stuff in the mail. And I made it as simple as I could. So the vast majority of the people in our group now are way past that point. So I'm glad you're asking these questions because then that's the kind of one-on-one stuff. If, you know, you want to get that first mailer out and then that's okay, first one or two, and then start tweaking it to uh, increase your yield. Yeah, speed. Okay, lots of comments on the milk thing. I get. It. Well, if I did one thing right, it was that milk example. Everybody gets that. It's good. I don't see a lot of people raising their hands here. Or am I missing it? Does anybody want to talk to me? Jill's not here. Signs on the property work very well, Jerry says, Jerry H. Signs on the property work well. If you can get, uh, you know, if you can place one there. <laughs> There's been a lot of times early on in my career when we we're going out taking pictures of property, we'd be just, I mean, out far where you need a gas, couple of gas cans to get back. And there'd be lit real estate signs out there. So we would always take pictures of them and call the agent and say, what the hell, when did you put that out there? And they all, without exception said, oh, you're the first or second person that's ever called on that. And we put it out there 12 years ago. That's why we do it this way. Chip, perfect. I'm a broker. Listing property sucks. Should I just end the comment right there? No, I won't. I respect. I'm a broker. Listing property sucks. With all the fields you have to input, you know, it won't, put, it, it won't publish until you do it all correct. Yeah, that's right. If you're lucky, it's been listed before. And I'm, so I'm told. And, uh, so this, you can pull an old listing and at least you had something to work with. That's my point with the assessor database. It'd be great to, see. at least you got, you know, 80% of the field, the silly fields populated, the ones that don't require any, any artistic anything. Just like what are the taxes and, you know, what are the GPS coordinates? Regarding, Jordan says, regarding picking a target market. All right, good. I like target market questions. We're putting together a website right now that completely replaces tax sale lists, as I referred to in the cash flow from land pro uh, program. It's called taxsaleforum.com. And we're about 60 days away from releasing it. And it gives, I mean, everything you've ever wanted to know, all the back tax information about with lists and liens, the lien deeds. Uh, I did a white paper, uh, 50 white papers on, on all the states on how it works from a back tax standpoint. Population density maps. I mean, it really o over the top. Um, so, and the whole point of that for a group is to, uh, the whole point is for our group is to, you know, choose a, a target market. So here we go. Jordan says, regarding picking a target market, one of the, uh, one of the video lessons uh, in the free ebook, you mentioned upstate New York. Yeah, and it has some good areas for this. Uh, you also say that you don't usually buy in the eastern part of the country due to the attorney requirement. Realistically, how much of a problem is this for someone just starting out? I ask, by the way, because I happen to live in New York State, uh, suburbs of New York City, and I have vacationed up in the Rondacks, and I know the area fairly, fairly well. That's a fantastic question, and um, I've been up there too, specifically in uh, Canada too, right over the border close to uh, Montreal and it's beautiful. And uh, New York, the, the metropolitan New Yorker is packed with people who go to upstate New York for vacations and stuff. So, and the pr property is super cheap. So the deals that we've done up there, um, 
you know, we, it, they, they got closed like this. We would call the county and talk to somebody there, usually the, uh, the recorder. And he or she would give us a name of one or two or sometimes three, super local, right down the street, lawyers who can close deals. And you have to do it super cheap. You know, are you going to buy like 300 quarter acre properties in New York and, and, uh, and, you know, with separate owners and, and justify paying an attorney to close all those deals? No. But if you get 40 acre property in Northern uh, New York, which is incredibly valuable for four or five grand and, you, and your closing costs with an attorney are a thousand bucks, you're going to do great. So it's all a function of, uh, of cat, you know, of whether or not it works, you know. It all, it's all a function of the of the money, the you know what the economics work. Well, I'm being told somebody is raising their hand. Hi, it's Jill here. Can I interrupt for a minute and say hi? Yeah, Joel. Joel, one second. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jill. <laughs> hi, I. You would not believe where I happen to be standing at this moment. Let's hear so it. Right next to Mark here, we have a we have about forty person conference call, and I just busted in to say hello and tell them where I am. <laughs> So, oh, we're having a bad time. It's snowing. The weather's horrible. It is, and I'm staring at all these models. I'm literally staring at a room full of models. So I am here at Madison Square Garden. I am backstage and uh, in between shows and, and just crazy day, and it is freezing cold. So how, how are you? Everything's going well. Good. We what have, we what have I missed? Anything great? Oh, we've missed me droning on about real estate. I think we, <laughs> this is a perfect time. Tell us, uh, tell us what you see like your reporter. Like a reporter. Okay. Literally it's a long haul and everybody's kind of getting changed and getting into their, their next wardrobe attire. And it's, it's the good news is it's freezing cold outside, but it's pretty cool. Toasty in here. The weather is fleshy and yucky and, and uh, woke up to the snow, but it's, it's just so much fun. So it's more importantly, it's really how, good. how do you feel about your own outfit today at a fashion thing? You know, more, you know, I'm going to tell you, I actually feel pretty good. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> That's the, what uh, the long, it is the long jacket that I, I happen to, ch to choose today actually fits in well with my friend's uh, collection. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, oh, I, okay. I'm doing okay. <laughs> And I yes, going into this, I was a little worried because you know that's not my thing, but I'm I'm doing okay. So <laughs> having a ball. So any great any great questions? Anything for me? I can ask real answer real quick. Um, these both have been pretty you know information questions, not real inspirational. So it's it's yeah. bit, oh, in black sucks. and white that it's Jack only today. Well, I don't want people to like. I don't want this to become a thing. I don't want to, you know, I want to well, be part of it. Everybody who's <laughs> listening doesn't want it to be just Jack either. Trust me. Oh, good. <laughs> I can't see what any of these saying. Is anybody saying anything? I can't read. I don't have any, any visual. So hi, everyone. Kathleen there. Kathleen should be here. <laughs> Kathleen's my fashion girl. She should be here. <laughs> no, so, uh, I don't see any or any comments, but no, I mean, I'm really glad you cut in though. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, um, Hey everybody. It's nice to check in and, and, um, I will be back next week. I promise. And hope everybody's having a really good week and you too, Jack, did you tell them some yeah. of the stuff that you're working on? Oh yeah. We're oh, good. Eking, eking it out a little bit, but. It's an okay. IT first quarter for us, first and second quarter for sure. I am so excited with the stuff that we have coming up. And um, I know we can't share a lot of it right now, but I promise everyone, Jack and I are here to solve everybody's problems. Well, let me put it this way. As fast as we can. This is what she's <laughs> referring to. You know how there's Pat Live? Well, we created JillLive.com, and that's coming too. Yep. I don't We're going to really get you some more of that. Exactly. Yep. We're getting some more of that. Um, <laughs> I, I got a note from Aaron that said, Kathleen says, I know I'm walking the Versace. <laughs> Yay, Kathleen. <laughs> so um, I love it. Yeah, we're, we're going to get especially some of the little mundane stuff out because we've got a lot of, we have a, maybe a new member. I don't know if he's on the phone right now. Um, 
but I just talked to him the other day and he's like, what do I do, you know, during the day? And that's a really valid question. And, you know, I was telling him, get in success plant, use your peers. And, and, uh, Jack and I are working on solving it for you. We're going to get stuff that we can take those little tasks out of your world, like answering the phone yep. and I'll get you some really good scripts and all kinds of good stuff. Exactly. So, cool. Thanks, Jill. Well, thanks for letting me. You're welcome. Thanks for letting me bust in, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Have a good have, week. Thank you. you. I'll be back fun. in LA. Drink champagne. Thank you. Have a good week, everyone. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's coming. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye. Joel, I'm unmuting you. I'd love to hear your, your, uh, your question. You're unmuted. No, no question, really, Jack. Just, uh, I'm, I'm betting that nobody knows how to actually raise their hand. It looks like Michael got it down, but. Can you explain it Because really you, you obviously know. Where is the little hand raising thing then? Um, I got mine from the participants. If you expand that, I usually keep it. Yeah, uh, so you can see who else is on the call. Yeah, and then you can see at the bottom. So you, you see like the, the five there and it has unmute me and lower hand or raise hand. Awesome. So that's where people need to go to get Great. that. You have no question. Nope, no questions. Just wanted to pitch in with that. Awesome, man. Thank you. Thanks. Michael, you're unmuted. Go for it. Hey, Jack. Thanks for letting me uh, speak. Sure. The question I wanted to ask you was uh, kind of about the same question I asked last week about making offers to homeowners uh, using RealQuest data. And I wanted to know more about how you might price an area. Do you, do you only send offers, let's say, to a subdivision where you have a real good concrete understanding of what all the houses are, and then basically maybe send out an offer at, let's say, 60% of, of the market value, or do you use, some, do you use the assessor's number uh, in there uh, to try to figure out some type of offer price that's uh, you know, a good wholesale value but not overpriced either? Okay, yeah, that's about 90% correct. Um, yeah, we, so I never, I don't even look at the assessed value at all when, I, when we uh, do, a, 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 we call them SFR mailers, single family residential. So again, it depends on what you're gonna do when you buy it. All we do, if you listen to the show, is we mark it up 10 grand. I don't care if it's a $300,000 house or an $80,000 house, we mark it up 10,000 bucks and we're real transparent about, transparent about it. And we sell it to one guy. We only ever take his order. So. Uh, and we don't even go look at it. We send all the mailers out. And the way that we gauge it is we, we do it in, we try to do it in master plan communities, which means all the house, there's like four models of one house. And we look at what it's selling for, and then we get the square footage data, and that's how we price it. So if one model's 3,000 feet, one model's 2,200 feet, one model's 1,800 feet, we, I, I don't go so far as to break down the comps for those, that style of house. But if it's in a mastering plan community and the average sale price is like $120 a foot, then I'll do the, I'll multiply it out that way and we'll offer, we usually try to go in at about 60% of what ARV is, ARV is theoretically when it's all done and finished and completely done. Okay, so master plan communities, figure out the retail price per square foot, take 60% of that and make that your offer price. Cool. But if you're going to try to get anything out of it more than ten grand, it's going to be tough for the guy who's going to do actual work to clean it up, to make any yeah. money. So, and these are in houses that, these are in subdivisions that they were built in the eight. We're lucky because in Arizona they're built in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, sometimes the thousands. So all they need is like carpet, paint. No, there nobody's moving any walls. Maybe some kitchen appliances and stuff. Mm -hmm. This needs to be really cleaned up. If you want and that probably doesn't work in like in the northeast where i'm at where the you know there aren't these tracks of houses per se the houses are scattered everywhere there's different sizes it's just mm -hmm. it's just so variable from street to street to street versus something like maybe like cleveland or something or i don't know some places where all the houses are kind of generic yeah the way to solve that and there, there are places in, in the phoenix area that are like that and we've had success there um the way to solve that is to go just scrape the bottom. So do the same methodology. Take a look at what a, what you think the ARV is, the super sale price. Still mark it up ten grand, but instead of sixty percent, and still use the the price per square foot model, pricing model.
but instead of 60, I mean, we go in at like 30 or 40 percent. And so you're going to get a ton of hate, as you can imagine. But, you know, and you're going to have to send out more letters to get one deal, but it works in the end. Right. Um, another quick question here. I'm about 750,000 bucks into mail at this point. And um, 750,000? No, seven hundred and fifty dollars to a thousand bucks in the mail. Oh, okay. Probably got about six or seven phone calls, so it's I'm definitely missing up, screwing up something here. Uh, my last set of uh, mail probably was going out around. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if it's hit yet, but uh, I have. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm still jumping the gun here, but. Uh, we talked when, like, was it this week? About a week, a week ago, ago, and I'm probably going to schedule another call with you probably one more week. I'm going to send out some more this week, so I'll, I'll try to have some better statistics for you, but uh, getting real, real troubled no. trying to get some my freaking phone to ring, and, uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, we're, if collectively we're all of us are heading to uh, the uh, um, southwest a little too hard, as indicated by Seth Williams' uh, latest uh, blog post. So. Yeah, did, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to actually post a link on Success Plan to that because I thought that blog post was brilliant. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, schedule a call. I'm happy to help help you out with all the details. Okay, great. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, okay let's see. Jordan says regarding, I'm trying to see if I'm, a, I'm on the, if I'm going backwards or frontwards. Yeah, backwards. One second here. Let me get my place. Okay, roads. Finding my place back here. Here he says, back to the Arkansas properties I bought. Um, and we talked about that in success plan a little bit. Uh, back to the Arkansas properties I bought. The state website showed the parcels in one place, but the county assessor shows it on, different, on a different road. I called the county clerk and they said they can't send me a plat map. And I told them, uh, I told the only way to be sure is to pay for a survey. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's typical county stuff. What you want to do is try to get uh, four people's opinions on where the property is. And I would so super for sure use Agent 24, uh, Title Pro 24-7. Go in there because there, there's a lot more GPS coordinates and maps than there are, and it's cheaper in the property reports than it is in uh, RealQuest. So check that too. Um, if you, they said they can't get a plat map. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Arkansas, there's a couple of counties in Arkansas that don't have computers. I mean, there's some people that, some counties don't have G, GIS sites. This count, there's a few counties that they, all they have is telephones. And they're happy, they're really proud of it. So Arkansas is a little bit behind the time. Again, uh, Curious says, is there any way to find the true location of a parcel? So. Uh, we met with, we had a call with the spatial people at RealQuest two days, two or three days ago, and they have uh, the corner points, you know, of all of 148.5 million properties in, in the country, literally. And so we've uh, cut a deal with them and the, the, our new IT staff is putting together um, picture Google, but not just one place to, not pl one place to, to, uh, to input what you're searching for, picture three lines like that. First is the state, the second is the county, and the third is the APN, and you hit enter. And it takes you right to the property in Google Earth. That's the product that we're gonna release. And that's gonna solve a ton of this. Is it 100% of the properties in the country? No, but it's like 98.7. And then in the co county coverage that's uh, included is fully disclosed right up front. So. You're gonna know if you're trying to find uh but you know so it sounds to me honestly Kerry, that this county you know they probably don't have the plat map and this may be one of the counties that you know they just not even real quest can get the data so i don't know i i learned this way too that there are some counties i checked to see the availability of the information 
before we even get involved because you can spend a lot of time going around and around trying to get maps. Luke says, do you ever do any promotional deals uh, with other people? Yeah, I, we do. I found some on YouTube channels. Uh, they like to promote off-grid tiny homes, exactly. Um, we were even kicking around the idea of, of getting a bunch of the suppliers, the vendors for the stuff that goes into these off-grid houses all together and like building one on a piece of land that we have and like filming the whole thing. So, but cause I don't have enough to do. Uh, thinking if I can enlist them to promote land and pay them, uh, you know, pay them for the results. I think that's great. Guys, cross marketing rocks. I think that you would do really well with that in a place like Colorado, where I think there's just, Colorado's kind of known for that um, independent lifestyle. So I think it'd be cool. Cross marketing, I don't think you can do, I don't think there's anything bad about it. Tim Flood, I'm far from executing. Uh, I'm far from executing, but where would I go to read up on specifics of taking 40 acre parcels and subdividing? This is what you do. And we're trying to get our hands around the uh, regions in the country that where you, they're up for it and where they're not. You wanna call planning and zoning. And uh, they're gonna tell you exactly what to how to do it. You're gonna get one of three or four answers. One answer would be for planning and zoning. No way, we haven't done that since 1997. Another answer will be, a potential answer is, are you related to the person who owns the, the large property? For some reason, they're real happy about in the in re, interrelated party splits. Uh, one of the answers you potentially get is, heck yes, we do that all the time, but you only can split it into five parcels. That's the way Arizona is. And, and even now they're, you know, you have to make sure you talk to the county in great detail and, and get the forms and stuff. Because you can take a property, but you can't split it into six, but you can split it into five. And it's only if you can rewrite the descriptions and now certain counties want surveys and roads and all kinds of stuff. So it, it, there's no central place. But this is one of the reasons it's so profitable. There's no central place, you know, like a database where you can just look it up and say, yep, in Alabama, in County X, it works for sure. If there was, it would only work for a while because the county would get upset about processing stuff, that many requests. The best way to do that, and I spoke with a guy today about this at length. He's in our group. He's been in our group for a while. I didn't even know he was in our group, but he's a former uh, commissioner of a, of a county. He's retired. And he heard one of our podcasts and, and called, uh, called us and, and reached out and said, well, heck yeah, we can do that. We've been doing that for a while and I know who to talk to. And, you know, he never said it's an old boys network and he never said we're going to cheat. He said, I know exactly who to talk to and what we exactly what we have to do to, to make sure that it's transparent and legitimate and the whole thing. So it really, really helps to know people locally to get that done properly. Let's see here. I lost my way again. Cross promotion, 40 splits. Chip says, Luke, I worked for a retail land company. All right. I worked for a retail land company and they would offer, often partner with a log cabin builder and other packages with land and log cabin packages. And you all know where this is going to cross promote. I don't think you'd run into any real estate license issues with uh, tiny homes because many of them are titled as mobiles and uh, they're on wheels. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. There's a company in Arizona for a while. I don't see them around anymore. They would build, it was on the side of the freeway. This is the only way I knew about it. Every time I drive by, they're constructing a log cabin and then they, they would construct it to make sure it fits and then they would deconstruct it, put it on a truck and, and go put it uh, up in Northern Arizona somewhere. And there was a company that we purchased a bunch of properties from. They subdivide really large acreage prop, properties into 40 acre parcels and they, they cross marketed with that company. So you could pick out your cabin in an urban area, pick out your lot in a rural area on a weekend and go up there three weeks later and the thing's waiting for you. Jessica says, hi Jack, you mentioned in the education uh, to have an attorney. Look at the terms papers for you uh, to provide the package um, before you use it. I'm wondering about this because I'm planning additional costs for the future. Should I have a local attorney? Look at the form based uh, in the county that the property's in. 
So the terms contract might need to be reviewed by an attorney each time or once per county per state. Okay, so this is a good question. You know, she's exactly right. And I do say that the terms agreement that's in there is the one that we use. We have a lot of experience and we know what to do if anything goes sideways, which is I'm not going on wood hasn't done. We haven't had that problem. So I would highly recommend um, first I would go, I would spend a lot of time on the internet trying to find one that's state specific. I haven't heard any that are county specific, but, but it's possible. So you, it's not going to take long before you find one that's state specific. Then and the person who's providing it on the internet probably is the attorney one you want to call. They put it there for a reason. Um, then there's not a lot to, uh, to really talk about. If the attorney posted a version of one that they think works, it's gonna be a pretty short conversation. But the point to here is that the contract or the agreement suggestion that's in the program doesn't work everywhere. You can make it, you can use it everywhere. It may or may not be binding. David says, I'm a newbie as of yesterday, all right. I'm getting ready to set up my business phone and virtual address. So uh, I can uh, include my first offers to owners. All right, awesome. I'm not worried about actually setting it up as an LLC right now, good. But I'm wanting to find out, uh, find out if, if the address I'm using to receive mail, which will probably be different uh, in a different state, should that virtual business address be tied anywhere um, to I create the LLC? It's a good question. So he's asking, where he incorporates, does this physical address have to be there? Uh, it makes sense to me that I want the LLC to use the same address. And I'm asking because I want to select uh, an available virtual address in a state where I create the LLC advice. Well, a lot of, a lot of states, when, when you incorporate, they require that you have a statutory agent stat agent. Some states don't. Nevada does, Delaware does, all the states where there's a, a lot of corporate secrecy, for some reason they require a local stat agent and they don't let you for some reason also, I don't know why, pick like a, a mailboxes, et cetera place. So my advice would be to get an address and to, to incorporate in the same state and to get the address where there's somebody, because a lot of mail is going to go there. The operators are going to go there. Make sure they can send you the stuff, whether they uh, scan it in and email it to you or, or uh, you know, make sure that there's a human being on the end. So if you can, if you're on vacation, you can get stuff at a different place there too. But it, yeah, you know what? You don't want to get too hung up on these little details, but I do think it makes sense to have everything kind of centrally located. Not necessarily the state you live in. Oh, Luke says, uh, probably at Michael's thing, six to seven calls. Send out more mail. I missed that many. <laughs> I missed that many calls during listening to this call. That's hilarious, Luke. You know, it sounds like a cliche, but he's right. You know, and I talk about Luke on our consulted calls a lot. You know, you don't want to send out hordes and hordes and hordes of mail incorrectly, but there's a lot, of, not a lot of room for error. You know, get creative. The very, I talked about it on the show several times. Jill and I talk about it all the time. The variable is not whether or not this works because it works everywhere. Not only does it work for land, it works for everything else too. Cars and all that other stuff. And we'll get to that next year. The variable is price. You know, are you gonna offer a hundred dollars for a 2012 Forerunner? So you, you have to do a little bit more homework than that. You have to really figure out um, what properties you're selling for and, and apply some logic. And the logic in Arizona is not the same logic uh, as, as Massachusetts. It's just not. So the more you send out, you know, what, what we're all here to do is mitigate risk. That's what this business model is. Just by buying land, we've mitigated a ton of risk over houses. And then just by buying rural land, we've mitigated a ton of risk over uh, urban land. And now not financing it, we've mitigated more risk. And on and on and on. So um, you just have to barrel through it. It's really, really, really comes down to pricing. I, I wouldn't consider mailing out less than $1,500, uh, 1500 mailers. 
let's see. And carry a tried title pro. So, you know, I, I have I have to admit I've had problems like this in in uh, Arkansas myself, in Texas, and uh, New Mexico. I've had problems in New Jersey, but not because they didn't have maps, which I'm not going to go into. Kathleen says I got a call back on a mailer. It was for four ninety five. Uh, five, well, 495. It was for five acres, 4.95 acre parcel, which I offered 2,300 bucks. Nice, nice creative pricing. And I'm, I bet you a dollar she's got a great reason for that price. I haven't had a great response from this mailer. Its streams have been quiet, um, a little bit of hate. Yeah. Uh, I think my prices were a little bit low. Sales comps are uh, all over the place, five to 28 grand or similar size parcels. This has got all the making of a home run. Parcel had electricity um, and from 1989 or 1979. Let's see, I'd like to, I'd like to be in this uh, county for a lot of reasons. I'm considering increasing my offer, especially because there's uh, power available. But the DW is probably more of a de uh, determinant than an asset. I don't know what DW is. This parcel was previously listed for <laughs> 38,000 bucks. Uh, sat on it, uh, Sat on the market for 180 days plus and didn't sell. Should parcels with power available or septic or well be priced differently? And if so, what percentage of raw land, uh, you know, what percentage of it do you, do you offer on the raw land? Uh, I, you know, I never, I don't price property based on attributes. You know, if you've got that data and I think maybe you're, you're pouring into RealQuest, I don't know if you're pulling the septic information and power information on RealQuest, I doubt it. Sounds like you've got it from another source, which is super cool. Uh, I don't, you know, my answer to that would be try to find uh, a massive, well, hopefully the data set's huge. Let's say it's 10 or 12,000 uh, properties and send everybody out an offer for 2,300 bucks. Let's call it the Luke Smith method. Not really look into this at all. Pound it out. And one or two people are gonna send it back and they're gonna say, thank you. I don't wanna pay the tax bill anymore. So it's not so much about focusing on the real estate, I don't think. It's just trying to find the two or three people in, in the thousand, eight, five, six thousand people that you send letters to that just don't want to, they don't want the property any longer. That's what I think. Rod says, Jack, have you heard, uh, I have heard you mention that you res resisted Facebook. Yeah, how did you learn how to make it work for you? Oh man, I got a Facebook. You, you're hundred percent right. Um, I was, I was, uh, it was the biggest career mistake I have made in my life in any career since the beginning was not embracing social media. You know, I thought it was too good for it. This is a lot of years ago. So I got a Facebook, uh, after we got our butts kicked during the downturn, I got a Facebook like in every social media environment, got a username and tried to figure it out. You know, I'm 50. If I can figure it out, all of you can just knock it out of the park. And so for business, you know, I don't talk to anybody from high school for, I just don't. But for business, Facebook is, is uh, one of the best kept secrets ever. If you've ever posted an ad, I encourage you just to do this for fun. Take your Facebook account and get a Facebook ad and just go into it knowing that you're not going to do it right. The amount of information, and one of the processes that they do when you, when you post this, is they, they ask you who you're target marketing. And I fell out of my seat the first time I did it, how specific it is. Every click you make in Facebook, everything you click on, every comment you make, goes into algorithms to, to make sure or to, to predict, let's say for sake of argument, that you might be, uh, be considering buy, buying a Volvo over a Suburban. Or you might be, you might be they, they know you're in the land business. If you're using Facebook not for high school reasons, so when you go to post an ad about a piece of property that's for sale and they, when they ask you who you're marketing this to and you scroll through there and scroll through there and you find real estate, real estate agents, nope, nope, uh, rural vacant land eventually. And I'm oversimplifying because they don't make it super, super simple. But I'll tell you, when you launch that ad and if the graphic's okay, and they'll tell you if the graphic sucks, they'll say your response is gonna suck on this. Keep trying. When you launch an ad, it's going to work. Hey, by the way, this is how Mark Podolsky gets so much traffic 
you know, we don't, we choose not to do this. We did it for a brief time for a lot of reasons. I just, for Land Academy, it's not, it's great to sell property, but not for this. So you can, whatever you're selling, I don't care if you're selling gopher traps. I got a buddy who's got gophertraps.com, a dropship company and kills it just because of Facebook. So Facebook, I would heavily suggest that um, you really, you just, you look at it in the Facebook groups too. It's also, somebody just mentioned groups. Let's see here. Jack, why not move success plan to a closed Facebook group? Because um, we're smart and we think things through and we'd rather have our own website and control it uh, for a bunch of reasons. You know, we're, we're launching like eight products this quarter. They're all different dot coms. They're, they'll all be cross marketed. And um, the kind of people that are on Facebook that are always on there, they're incredibly prevalent on Facebook and nowhere else. Uh, you know, that that's not, we have engineers and, you know, I did, I took two calls, two consulting calls on Wednesday this week. One guy is a, a retired aerospace pilot tester or a airplane tester. We talked about the coolest stories ever. So he's been with us for quite some time. And the other guy is a CFO for a very, very large construction company in the South, multi, you know, hundred million dollar construction company. So these are the kinds of people that are in this group with you. And I'm pretty confident that they didn't find us on Facebook. That's why. We're running out of time. Jill's not here to like offset my, my rants. Jerry says it took about 3000 mailers before my phone really started ringing. Okay, good. That's good. That's excellent. Hey, you know, part of the thing too about success plan as it is in its own state, that's first generation stuff. I did that, I, you know, I created face plant myself in, in my back bedroom. So the next generation awesome face, uh, Facebook uh, success plan, next generation success plan is gonna rock. It's gonna actually look like Facebook. We're, we're building it right now, not me this time, which is why it's gonna work. Joel says, I also, I thought I uh, was messing up my first mailer last week and today I'm working on closing four deals. That just makes me happy. <laughs> Tim, this is just fantastic. I'm gonna read this out loud. The hate has gone to a new level <laughs> with this mailer. One guy just sent me a message of his private parts text message that's just <laughs> that takes a takes a cake you know if you didn't hear it on the show my favorite still to this day is somebody wrote me a very heartfelt letter and said asking me who raised me that I would have the, the gumption to offer that kind of who raised you that's what she said all right we're coming to the end here I think right and we're running out of time Joel says, my mistakes were only, um, were only about a, a thousand offer sent. Uh, sat on the data for a couple months before sending it to the mailer. Offer price break was too low. Uh, last part, this is a very common, um, you know, this is common. And the last part helped uh, when I found out the same uh, property is actually five acres when RealQuest data said that it was eight to 10. So there's stuff like that that's, that can happen. So just like everything in life, I think uh, you got to do it a couple times before you really kind of figure out and say, oh. And Jerry says, Michael just spread it out over a number of, uh, of counties, but take uh, 2,500 bucks and drop it into data and mailers. And that's awesome. And thank you for, for mentioning that. All right. Well, we did it without Jill with no real casualties. I don't think unless somebody's crying in the corner and I can't see them. That could be. Thanks very much, everyone. We will see you at the same time next week. <laughs>